pray. Holy and blessed Trinity, in these days of horrific violence, stir up in us the power of your love to be your hands, your voice, and your deeds of courage and the new life for the sake of the world. Amen. There is a thread, there are many threads, running through scripture uh, that have to do with this amazing, scandalous, countercultural message of the prophets and Jesus and the apostles. And one of them has to do with banquets, feasts, marvelous feasts, from Isaiah again. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples. And the scripture loves the word all. A feast of rich food, a feast of well-matured wines. I always like that part. Of rich food filled with marrow, of well-matured wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. Lest you didn't catch my emphasis, all is very important in this lesson, as it is for Jesus. Now, I'm not preaching on the wedding banquet, because I already did one of those parables, and it's similar. So um, I'm preaching on basically Isaiah and Psalm 23, which is one of those psalms, as you may know, that is, uh, has the honor of being the most beloved passage in all of scripture in the world. And how do I know this, you're saying? Uh, because there are people who are, have like this real obsession with biblical data, and they count these things. <laughs> and so pastors get to know this and share it, like we are really smart. And the second one, I bet you know what it is, John 3.16. Partly because it's uh, waved around at a lot of ball games and so forth. But at any rate, this psalm, and here's the thing. When you and I know this psalm, most of us, and maybe many of us could say it by heart. We've heard it at many funerals and so on. Uh, but there's this marvelous danger about knowing it too well. Because then you don't return and get astonished by it, see? Wrote. And there's nothing wrong with memorizing things. We need that. But today I hope that I will help us all become more astonished at the allness of God, the grace of God, and yes, even the scandal of God's unconditional love for all, for everybody, and for all of creation, by the way. We don't stop just with people. So the person who wrote Psalm 23, we're not really sure who it is, the idea that David did it was a superscript that was added later after the Bible was done and they were collecting them all together. Doesn't matter. Whoever the psalmist was, was on a journey. Like mine, like yours, a journey of life, a journey of faith, a journey through amazingly wonderful moments in life, beautiful times, and then also unafraid to share that there are bad times in life. One of the things I used to tell uh, parents all the time was, you don't do your kids any favor by shielding them from tragedy or by not bringing them to a funeral. Bring them. Share early on. Say to them as courageously as the psalmist, there will be times, Jack. There will be times, Miranda, when you will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. What's that, Mom? What's that, Dad? Oh, let me share it with you. Because I love you, and I want you to know it's going to happen. Yeah, it's a slice of life. That's the way it is. But uh, it's, interestingly how, it's interesting how the psalm is formed. Six short verses. The most beloved passage in all of the world. The first three are about marvelous times. Quiet waters, green pastures, the Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I need. 
I remember back in seminary, and I don't, and I forget the rabbi's name, first century rabbi, who woke up one morning, and instead of his regular devotions, this was his simple prayer. God, if this were the last day that I had in life, I give you eternal thanks for this moment alone. Life is so good. And I've had those moments. Sometimes really strong ones, sometimes sort of medium strength. But uh, days where I've said at the end of the day, my God, what a beautiful, beautiful world. I'm glad I was born. I'm glad I got to see the world. I got to experience your love, God, in people, in animals, in all of creation. And that's it. Verse 1 through 3, the Lord is my shepherd, nothing I will want. Life is good. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Remember the metaphor of shepherd and sheep. You want green grass. That's the most nutritious rather than dried brown gra grass. And the psalmist says it. You brought me nourishment. You lead me beside still waters. Life is so good. Tranquil at times. You restore my soul. You lead me in right paths for his namesake. Life is good in the first three verses. And then what happens? Verse 4, right in the middle. And in verse 4, the psalmist describes something that happened to him or her. We don't know what it is. It could be an impending death of a relative of his or his own. It could have been an illness. It could have been shame. He was shamed by the community. Uh, we talked about this in Bible study. All of the Old Testament and New Testament is framed by the shame and honor system. And if you get shamed, it's no small thing. It's huge. It's a tragedy. It was a tragedy for their lives. Okay, so we don't know what it was. It could have been something the psalmist herself or himself did that was really bad. You know, and is working with rightful guilt about that. That's a tragedy. Um, notice, though, what the psalm does not say. It says there's going to be tragedy. It basically, the psalmist is telling the truth the way it is. It doesn't say that God will keep the pious from all harm, does it? Or that your life will be danger-free if you pray, read the scriptures, and do good things, all of which are good. Do them. <laughs> we want to do them. They're, they're part and parcel of our faith. But it does, it's not a transaction. It's not a tit-for-tat. It's what we want to do. But there isn't a protection bubble given out by God from tornadoes and hurricanes and speeding bullets because we're Christian or religious or that we love people and do nice things. Well, all of life is a gift. And Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit are not into transactional theology at all. It's all gift. Um, but... Note, our culture, and especially parts of the Christian church, have saturated the media with a different kind of theology, and that is this. If you're sick, it's a, it's a sure sign that God is displeased with you. But if you're healthy, you've been a good boy and a good girl. That's how it works. See, health, wealth, and success, we call it. And it has an enormous following in our culture, sadly, still. I once had an intern back in the 90s. Brian, he was brilliant. A little odd, but brilliant. And uh, you know how this works, Pastor Kim? You go two years into theological training. We have pastors here, other pastors. Then you go on internship. And you know, I had them that year uh, for internship. And then you come back your last year and you put all that you've learned, all this marvelous theology and scripture, and you put it together and you decide, do I really feel called to be a pastor? after I've dealt with congregations in all that life brings, see? And I'm being funny here because uh, I love my parishes dearly. And, he, and then you go back in that senior year, you write your senior paper in a class called Faith and Ministry, it was called back then. And his was brilliant. He got so many accolades about it. He sent it to me in his final year. And we used it in our congregation for three months as a Bible study. And the paper was called... Into every life, a little rain must fall. Right? You live long enough. You love someone deep enough. You will be hurt. It's the way it is. Um, 
We don't understand why God made the world the way it is. We may want another world, but this is the one we got, see? And uh, we know that our life is complex. It's ruled at times by genetics, environment, things out of our control, violence out of our control. Um, we don't know why, and this is the problem, this is the fancy word for it is theodicy. Why evil and tragedy if the world is run by a sovereign, loving, powerful God, right? And, and by the way, no one's completely figured that out. <laughs> but we work on it. We talk about it, see. Um, no, it, the life we live is a life of goodness in spite of the difficulty in understanding theodicy and, and tragedies. Or as I used to tell the confirmands, uh, you're too young for this now, but one day you might enjoy a kiss from someone. You may be in your 30s or something, you know. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> Hormones are racing at those ages. And but I got their attention. The pastor's talking about kissing. I said, do you think that would be good? I, don't tell me you've had one yet. But do you think that would be fun? Oh, yeah. And I said, you know what? The reason it's fun is because of something called gravity. Gravity? No, no, Pastor. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't kiss someone or hug them if we didn't have the property of gravity. Oh. But, I said, just remember, that same marvelous power that can draw two lips together. I mean, I made it juicy can make you fall on a hike, break your leg, could kill you. That same marvelous power of gravity, if we didn't have it, life would be missing a lot, wouldn't it? It's a mixed bag, folks. This is life. And the psalmist is honest enough to say it. What he uses is, the valley of the shadow of death is real. Or as we used to learn, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Here it's translated, the darkest valley. Same thing. It's, but I like the valley of death because it's really urgent there, see. You could die at any moment. And when a loved one dies or a good friend dies, we all know that hurts, see. It's a package deal. That's the way life is. The baptismal life we're plunged into has one promise, and it's huge. That we die and rise in Christ. That's Christianity, death and resurrection. That we die to the old life, and we rise to the new, and in that rising, which, by the way, happens not just at the end of time, as we were talking about in Bible class. Marvelous Bible class this week. Uh, not just at the end of time, but right now. Right now, we rise with God's strength to address the problems of the world because God thinks we're that important. See? And you are. Every one of you. Uh, in 2000, uh, 2011, almost all 65 ELCA bishops gathered in Israel and Palestine. Uh, we spent most of our time in Palestine, but we also spent it in Israel. It was an official uh, trip. Um, heads of communions were to meet heads of communions in Israel and in Palestine, which we did. We met with a head rabbi in Jerusalem. We met with Bishop Munib Yunan, who was the bishop then of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land, which I don't call it the Holy Land. That'll be for another sermon. But... Uh, we met with people who were important leaders and we stayed with everyday people, families, in Hebron, in Ramallah, in the West Bank, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, all three families. And we found out things there that you never hear in American media. You just don't hear it. The realities that were both marvelous and awful uh, on both sides, by the way, and I don't even like the word sides. Um, and Bishop Hansen, who was the presiding bishop at that time, he said, 7.30 on Tuesday night, I want you to all back at the cloister. We stayed at a Roman Catholic guest house. There, there will be two men to talk to you, and your lives will never be the same again. And he was right. So we gathered. 
Uh, it was a, a room smaller than this, but not too much smaller. And the bishops were all in a semicircle like this, and up here was a card table. Two men sat there, one older one, one younger one. I was guessing that the older one was <laughs> in his early 50s. The younger one was less than 30, just a kid. And they sat side by side, they didn't say a word. They waited till all these bishops, you know, blah, 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 blah quit talking. And, they, and the older one said, I guess it's time to begin. We had no clue what was happening. And he looks at the younger one, he says, who should start first? And the younger one says, flip a coin. Yeah, so he flips a coin and he wins. He says, I'll start. My name is Rami. I'm an eighth generation graphic designer here in Jerusalem. I'm an Israeli. And I was born with a narrative ringing in my ears since I was a kid. It went like this. All Palestinians are evil. All Muslims are animals. All those who live in the West Bank and are Palestinians want to kill us. You need to hate them. And if possible, help kill them. And he's just being honest. He says, this was the narrative that I and my brothers and sisters and my friends grew up with in Israel. Then he said, uh, I joined the army so I could combat the infidels. And I got back and married a beautiful woman and had a beautiful little girl, Smadar. She was 14 years old when this happened. She and two other friends, they were all 14, these three 14-year-old girls, got on the bus and went to the Ben Huda Street to the library to get books. And that was the last day of their lives. Because on that bus was a Palestinian bomber who took out 13 people, including my daughter. He said, do you know what it's like to lose your daughter to a terrorist, to an animal? He said, I'm just telling you, all I could think of was murder, was hatred, was revenge. And I nursed it for years. And I was miserable. Then some well-meaning friends said to me, Rami, uh, you're not yourself. I'd like to invite you. We'd like to invite you to a meeting. Where, he said. Well, the meeting place, where? They said, Bethlehem. I'm not going to Bethlehem. Filled with Muslims and Christians. And they said, we think it would really be good for you. What's it about? It's called the parent circle, they said for parents who have lost a child. They had to ask him six times before he went. And he said, well, what part of town in Bethlehem is it gonna be? Oh, at one of the Lutheran schools. Did you know the Lutherans have four schools in Palestine? 2,400 students, mostly Muslim, then Christian, and then a few Jews. And the first class they have every morning is world peace. The second one is care of creation. They're way ahead of us. And you've got Muslims and Christians and a few Jews holding hands at the opening devotion, Allah, which is the name of God for Christians and Muslims. Allah, bless this day with peace for all, period. Let go of your hands, get to class. Every day, Allah bless us to be peacemakers. Okay, uh, so anyway, he said, I got to this place, the name of the school was Talitha Kumi. He said, I don't know what that meant. He said, I got to this place and here was something I'd never seen. Palestinian men, my age, with tears in their eyes, running up to me and hugging me. Before I even introduced myself, they knew that I had lost Smada, my beautiful little girl. And he said, something happened to me, something broke. He said, I couldn't even believe I was enjoying this and learning from it. And he said, and then he looks over to the kid. And he goes, that's where I met this guy. Now this guy gets up. He says, my name is Matson. I'm Muslim. I'm a Palestinian. I grew up with a narrative. It went like this. All Jews are animals. All Jews hate us. They don't recognize us. They want to kill us. Have nothing to do with them except for war. He said, all my brothers, same thing. Everyone in our family was taught this. Everyone in our neighborhood was taught this. 
Do you remember that song from South Pacific? You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. And then Matson says, yeah, during that first intifada, my brothers and I were sent to jail for no reason. No one of us had a rock in our pocket. That was it. During the second intifada, 2002, we got a call from the hospital. My mother took it. They said, we found a body of a 60-year-old man. He was riveted with bullets, many of them. He was dead. It was Matson's father, his beloved father. Now, he stopped, and he just broke down. He said, you have no idea how much I love my father. He was shot while taking groceries out of the grocery store and walking back to the West Bank for no reason. You know, he wasn't a bomber. He wasn't, didn't have a gun. He didn't have enough rock. He just lay there dead. And he said, you know what my first thought was? The narrative was right. They're all animals. They're all rotten, see? And he said, then I met this guy. And then the two of them stood up and embraced and cried. And all the bishops, we were like puddles watching this, see? And then they explained that they had become empowered in the middle of their tragedy. Yea, what does it say? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. You provide a, what? Banquet in the middle of my, in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. And they have been for years partnering together to go all over the world, universities, congregations, seminars, to say the narrative is a lie. The narrative is a lie. Look at this guy. I love him. I'd give my life for him. What a different narrative than what he grew up with. Why? Because God is with us, friends, in the great marvelous times, and God is with us in the worst of times. And this is, by the way, what Martin Luther championed so wonderfully, the theology of the cross. That God is found in every part of life, that there is no part of your life, no experience that is so dark, so rotten, so evil, that God won't go in there with you, see, and transform it and make all things new. And your life, Christian, is bound up in Jesus' life, and you can't get out of it forever. Now, yes, on that great final wrap-up day, you know, the eschaton, the supper of the Lamb, yes, there'll be a banquet there, but there's a little banquet, as Pastor Kim was mentioning in Bible study, every week for us. I'm, I wonder if anybody here knows what that little banquet is. <laughs> Holy Communion, as you said, a foretaste of the feast to come. Bread and wine. And in that, and that's, no, that's not just a symbol. Yes, it has symbolic properties. It's the real presence of the Savior of the world. Or as I say, Isaiah says, all peoples, all peoples, all nations, all people. See? Um, by the way, that story, I told you the name of the school and Matson met, one of our Lutheran schools there. Talath Akumi, you might remember from the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, it's in all three, where Jesus raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. And Talath Akumi literally means, it's Aramaic, Little girl, I say, arise. He told that to, at the end, then he broke down, thinking of Smadar. Um, no, Jesus comes to us all the time, um, and especially, Luther would say, in our times of struggle. Um, he comes, and Luther says this, Christ comes to us in the brokenness of our health in the shipwreck of our family lives. Then I added these other. Luther didn't add these, I did. In the disappointments of our occupation. You know, we, we, many of you, you love your occupation, but there are days, <laughs> right? 
uh, don't think of anyone in particular, but there are days in the loss of our peace of mind, our hurts and our angers. Jesus comes to us, see, in those times. Uh, he saves us in our disasters, not from them. Yes, we, we, we might like it differently, but this is the life we have, see. He emphatically does not promise to meet the odd winner of the self-improvement lottery, which is a big part of so much preaching in this country. You know, Jesus isn't into self-improvement. as eh, small potatoes. Eh, we don't do a very good job of it anyway. He's into death and resurrection. The death of the old in us so that the new can come out and bless the world for the sake of the world. Or as St. Paul says in his marvelous passage in 2 Corinthians, uh, the, anyone who is in Christ has a new life. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has begun. This is realized resurrection in our lives right now. And we're all ready for the party. That's, don't worry about it. That's way down the, the eschaton, the supper of the lamb. It'll be marvelous. There'll be these great wines. I'm looking forward to it. You know, aged well, cleared, clear wines and fat food dripping with big pork chops, I'm hoping, you know, Iowa chops and all that kind of stuff. But in the meantime, we are given a feast of God's love in Christ every day. And the Eucharist, and, and, uh, and this isn't applied to you by any means, but we were talking about how, you know, in, in Holy Communion, often people, and I understand it, they have a sorrowful look. We don't know what's going on in their lives. Something might have happened, and they're so happy to have the Eucharist that they cry. You know, you do that sometimes. But we could smile, too. It's an hilarious meal. It's in contradistinction to all the naysayers of every culture. This Isaiah and Paul and Jesus are saying, in the middle of it all, laugh and have a banquet with good food. The best food. And then go out and be that new person. Yes, well, yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not yet come. Live in the joy of the banquet, even in the midst of the horrific events that are happening. And then let the resurrection that is in you make the world a better place with courageous Jesus actions. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.